Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. Akhenaten and the Alien Medallion Ancient Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten was an alien from outer space. At least that's the rumor that's been going around for years. But why him? Why this pharaoh? Akhenaten was born Amenhotep IV in 1353 BC, during the 18th dynasty of Egypt's New Kingdom. However, he changed his name and became obsessed with changing the religion of Egypt. He moved the capital from Thebes to Amarna and established the cult of Aten that would specifically worship the sun. Well, not exactly the sun itself, but the sun disk, which was an aspect of the god Ra. Ra was to be the one and only god, and from one day to the next, every Egyptian was to give up all the ancient gods and worship only one. He disrupted thousands of years of Egyptian tradition, and everyone hated him. He caused much civil unrest, although his beautiful wife Nefertiti stuck by him, as was her duty. But he was, in the eyes of his own people, a heretic, and probably a madman. Ancient alien theorists have speculated that because of the pharaoh's bizarre appearance and drastic changes, that maybe he was from outer space. It's true that Akhenaten had some extremely unusual features. He was skinny but with a large protruding belly and a long neck. He also had an elongated skull and huge eyes that took up way too much of his enormous head. Every depiction of the ancient pharaoh makes him look like he's from another planet. And while many argue he was an alien, historians say he likely just suffered from a genetic disease. He may have had Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic disorder that causes a person to have unnaturally long limbs because of a connective tissue problem. It can make people look a little strange, so it would make sense if the pharaoh suffered from it. However, the case of Akhenaten gets even stranger. There have allegedly been coins depicting beings with large heads and almond-shaped eyes. And then there is the strange metal shield. The story goes that it was discovered by a Professor Winwood. The details are vague, but you can see a strange being at the top with a huge head and large eyes above what looks like a UFO. Supposedly, Professor Winwood stole these artifacts from a tomb connected to the controversial pharaoh and then published his findings years afterwards. He was arrested for stealing artifacts, and now who knows whether these remarkable objects are even real. The scientific conclusion to this convoluted story is that Egypt was ruled primarily by incestuous families, and that was why they looked so much like aliens. What do you think about this mysterious pharaoh Akhenaten? Let me know your thoughts in the comments! Number 9. The Medusa Mosaics while archaeologists were excavating the Villa of the Antonines, which was used by Roman emperors in ancient Italy, they came across a pair of very strange but fascinating mosaics. They uncovered images of Medusa, the snake-haired creature from Greek mythology who turned men to stone with a single glance. The villa itself got its name because it was a primary residence for the Antonine dynasty when they ruled the Roman Empire from 138 to 193 AD. That was around the same time the mosaics were created, painted right on the floor of the villa. In both mosaics, Medusa was given a kind of mystery vibe. She's looking off into the distance while making a stern but thoughtful face. The ancient pieces of artwork are fascinating on their own, but to make things even more interesting, archaeologists aren't sure what the room was even used for. Associate Professor Deborah Arya Montri says it must have been quite impressive to enter the space. It was a massive 69 feet in diameter and had twin mosaics of Medusa. It was also decorated floor to ceiling in vibrant artwork. Unfortunately, we don't know what kind of artwork there was because most of the decorations were removed in the 18th century. Still, it would have been like walking into a glittering art exhibit. As for Medusa, she was a wildly famous figure in the days of the Roman Empire. Medusa heads were particularly popular as decorative features. They were painted in people's homes, and families even had statues of Medusa heads. She was all the rage back then. It makes sense that powerful emperors in the 2nd century AD had mosaics of her commissioned for their lavish estate. The Villa of the Antonines was positively massive. The villa was so big that it had its own amphitheater, where Emperor Commodus 
practiced his gladiator skills fighting wild beasts. And now for number eight. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Sergeant Capes and Mike Martinez. Thanks so much for watching and letting us be a part of your day. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Number eight, ancient amputations. Scientists recently unearthed an impressively preserved skeleton in a cave in Borneo from 30,000 years ago. The thing that immediately stood out to researchers was that the skeleton was the missing part of its leg. Upon closer inspection, they learned the prehistoric man had the lower part of his leg cut off as part of a surgery. This was a careful amputation, planned and performed with precision. The patient then went on to survive many years with their wounds fully healing. They didn't grow their leg back, but they appear to have healed as if they had access to modern medicine. The discovery of this ancient amputee has really shocked the archaeological community. Nobody ever thought Stone Age humans living in a cave would understand how to properly care for a severed limb. People barely understood how to take care of amputees during the American Civil War. It wasn't until the 1840s that modern scientists discovered bacteria, anesthesia, and all that they needed to properly remove a damaged limb and care for the wound. But as we can see by looking at the skeleton in Borneo, we're not as bright as we thought. Stone Age people also learned how to be professional surgeons. They didn't have the same technology, but they may have had the same understanding of infection. Scientists can say with certainty that the lower portion of the leg was removed using careful surgical motions. The bone is cut clean, something that can only be done with meticulous sawing. Otherwise, there would be a ragged pattern to show the violent hacking of a swift chop. Whoever did it also chose a position where there weren't any major blood vessels. This seems to suggest it wasn't the surgeon's first operation. There's also no evidence that the bone became infected, so they must have had the proper herbs to clean and maintain the wound. The conclusion here is that Stone Age humans were a lot smarter than we give them credit for. It also seems they understood the concept of infection, which paints these ancient humans in a completely new light. Are you impressed? I was. Number 7. The Capuchin Crypt The Capuchin Crypt is one of the creepiest places in Europe. The crypt itself is very small, consisting of a few tiny chapels underneath the Church of Santa Maria della Concezione dei Cappuccini in Rome. The crypt contains the disturbing skeletal remains of 3,700 people. The bodies are believed to belong to Capuchin friars that were buried by the religious order centuries ago. However, the display was never meant to be a horror show like it's treated today. The friars wanted the display of bones to be a silent reminder of mortality and the swift passage from life into the afterlife. Whatever the original intent was, the crypt is now a tourist attraction. People call it the Bone Church of Rome because it's decorated with thousands of human bones. There are bones dangling from the ceiling, tacked to the walls, and placed everywhere as pieces of decor. There are even mummified arms strewn about the chapel. It was only in 2012 that the city finally added a museum to explain the morbidity. The museum explains all about the Order of Friars Minor Capuchin, which was established in the early 16th century as a group of reformists. They devoted themselves to solitude and penance and grew to be a very powerful order in the Catholic Church. They built their bone ossuary between 1626 and 1631. And at the time, nobody thought putting skulls on the wall was gross or goth. In 1631, when the friars moved in from their old monastery, they bought 300 carts of dead bodies. You heard that right. They literally purchased 300 entire cartloads of corpses. They then got to work arranging them in the burial crypt, which was blanketed in soil brought all the way from Jerusalem. Then, whenever a friar died, they were buried in the holy soil without a coffin, and they typically spent about 30 years decomposing. Then, when the patch of soil was too crowded, the oldest friar would be exhumed and their bones would be arranged on the walls. The Capuchins would pray every single night in the Bone Chapel. In total, this place contains the bones of about 4,000 dead friars, all of whom perished between 1528 and 1870. Have you ever been here or would you like to go? Let me know in the comments! Number 6. The Egyptian Buddha 
Egypt has just made one of the most shocking discoveries in its entire archaeological history. A mission headed by Polish and American archaeologists uncovered a statue of the Buddha in the city of Berenike. This is astounding because it's the first statue of Buddha ever found in Egypt. It was located at the edge of the Red Sea, likely brought into the country during the Roman era. Mustafa Waziri, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, announced the discovery. And since 1994, the archaeological mission has been hard at work excavating the site. Berenike is an extremely old city founded in 275 BC by the Egyptian king Ptolemy II. He established it as a major shipping port on the coast and named the city after his mother, Berenike I. The real reason for a new coastal city was that King Ptolemy was in desperate need of elephants. He was fighting a war against the Seleucids and used elephants as war machines. Berenike was built specifically so the king could obtain more elephants at a faster pace. The port was built in a natural harbor where it was protected, and it soon developed into much more than an elephant deposit center. People were trading spices, textiles, frankincense, pearls, and other luxury goods from around the world. The city continued to develop until it was suddenly abandoned around 200 BC. Experts think the city was hit by an unexpected volcanic eruption, which decimated the landscape and frightened the locals into leaving their homes. They did eventually come back, and the city prospered once more, but there was a brief time it was completely empty. Now, archaeologists have found an Egyptian first in Berenike. The statue of the Buddha appears to be made from stone quarried south of Istanbul, but it may have been carved in Egypt. It might have even been part of a Hindu temple built by wealthy Indian merchants. This is a big shock, because nobody expected to find a Hindu temple in Egypt, yet that seems to be what's happening. Head of the U.S. mission, Stephen Sidebotham, says his team found an inscription in Hindi at the temple. It makes you wonder how many ancient temples were found in Egypt that were really dedicated to gods from other cultures. Just like so many cities today, Berenike was a melting pot. Number 5. The Red Stone Stonehenge might be the most famous monument in England, but it's not the most impressive. The largest and most overlooked standing stone in all of Britain is the Redstone Monument, a single piece of rock that stands 25 feet high and weighs 26 tons. The monument was created from grit stone harvested at Caton Bay, which was then dragged about 10 miles to where it still stands today. Did that just rhyme? It was then excavated by Sir William Strickland in the 18th century, a man who was a firm believer that the monument extends much deeper underground than anyone realizes. However, he worried that digging directly beneath the monument could threaten its stability, and so the monument remains untouched. What's even stranger about the Redstone Monument is that it's standing in a churchyard. It was originally constructed sometime in the late Neolithic period, between 4500 BC and 2200 BC. On one side of the stone is what appears to be a fossilized dinosaur footprint, although this has never been verified. There is also another stone in the churchyard, but the second standing stone is smaller and isn't nearly as impressive as the Redstone. The whole site is extremely bizarre. The Norman church dates back centuries and was likely built on what was already sacred ground. There is no doubt the monolith was the center of ritual activity an estimated 6,000 years ago. It likely remained an important sacred space up until the days of Christianity. Not knowing what the stone was, but wanting to use the holy ground, the Normans built a church here. Now the mysterious monolith is standing amidst the tombstones of the dead. What do you think the stone was for? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 4. The Plague Victim The bubonic plague has been ravaging humanity for thousands of years. The Black Death that decimated Europe in the Middle Ages is still around today. People contract the plague every year. It's just not a big deal anymore. Medical science is advanced enough that anyone who gets the plague can be saved so long as they're close enough to a hospital. But thousands of years ago, that wasn't the case. If you contracted the plague, you almost certainly died. 
That's exactly what happened to the world's very first known plague victim. A team of Latvian and German researchers recently identified the oldest known strain of the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis. They found it in the body of a hunter-gatherer who lived in Latvia 5,000 years ago. This has been a huge discovery. The presence of the ancient plague strain shows the bacteria emerged thousands of years earlier than scientists previously thought it did. The individual infected with the plague was a man between 20 and 30 years old when he died. He was likely bitten by a rodent carrying the disease. His skull was excavated long ago in the 1800s, but then it disappeared from record. However, it was located once more in 2011 in the private collection of anthropologist Rudolf Virchow. Only recently were scientists able to properly study the remains. The team tested teeth and bones, then sequenced the genomes and identified bacterial and viral pathogens. They were absolutely shocked to see that this random person died from the bubonic plague. Finding a victim like this is like a needle in a haystack. Now, they think the strain of Y. pestis may have come from a lineage that emerged 7,000 years ago. They appear to have identified a much older strain of plague that couldn't initially be transmitted to humans from fleas. There was some kind of evolution that happened, which allowed the plague to jump from animals to people. And this is just more evidence of how quickly a disease can manifest and devastate humanity. Number 3. The Sunken Figurehead Off the coast of Texel Island in the Dutch Wadden Islands, a shrimp boat made an unexpected discovery. An impressively preserved figurehead from an ancient ship was caught by accident by the crew of a shrimp boat. They found an ultra-rare figurehead in mint condition, adorned in a headdress known as a Phrygian cap, something that was once synonymous with emancipation, liberty, and independence. It's believed the figurehead was from a 17th century warship that sank during the Eighty Years' War between the Dutch and the Spanish. Taking place from 1568 to 1648 AD, the crew of the shrimp boat didn't know much about archaeology, so they posted photographs of their find on Twitter with hopes of learning more. This caught the attention of archaeologists who stepped in to investigate. Municipal archaeologist Michel Bartels was ultimately responsible for dating the statue. The artifact was made from solid oak, buried completely beneath the sea floor. Because it was totally blanketed by sediment, the ship managed to avoid being eaten by shipworms and other organisms. The sediment acted as a barrier, protecting the figurehead from water damage, and today it's still in mint condition, as if it fell off the ship just yesterday. While we don't know much about the shipwreck it came from, we do know about the figurehead itself. The history of its hat goes back to the Roman Empire. The Phrygians were a group defeated and enslaved by the Romans. Slaves were typically shaved bald so that they were easily identifiable. When a Phrygian was released from their bondage, they would wear a cap to hide their baldness. This became known as the Phrygian cap, and it was used as a symbol of freedom and independence during European colonialism. The Phrygian cap was also used in ancient Persia 500 years before the Roman Empire, but it was the Romans who made it famous. During the French and American revolutions, the cap was used as a symbol of freedom and meant you had aligned yourself to the cause of independence and liberty. Number 2. Medieval Gaming Pieces During recent preparation for housing development in Bedfordshire, England, archaeologists made a shocking discovery. Excavations had to be conducted by Cotswold archaeology before any real construction work could be done. And amazingly, the team of excavators found the timber frames of a medieval building, a couple of enclosures, and a gaming piece made from a cattle mandible. The gaming piece is known as a tableman. These carved pieces were used to play a variety of board games throughout the Middle Ages, but they were typically used in dice games. Two players would roll the dice and then move their pieces across the game board, fighting and trying to reach the other side first. The word tables comes from the Latin word tabula, brought to England during the Roman occupation 2,000 years ago, and this is where we get the words tabletop and board game. According to the excavation team, they don't know exactly what game the piece was part of, since they didn't find any surviving board, but it may have been part of the game Tabula. Tabula was a lot like modern backgammon, and likely came from the even older game Ludus Duodecim Scriptorium, or the game of 12 markings. This was a game where each player was given 15 pieces and 3 cubic dice. 
It was a primitive version of backgammon that became common in the 11th century AD. Any backgammon players out there? Let me know in the comments. Number one, protection from zombies. Belgian archaeologists in Turkey were excavating the ancient city of Sagalassos when they uncovered the tomb of a mysterious person from the second century. This was during the Roman age when Sagalassos was a Roman city. The tomb wouldn't have been that mysterious if it weren't for the two dozen bricks that sealed it shut and the additional layer of plaster. The tomb was encased in such a way to keep the dead inside forever, but anybody on the outside could have easily smashed through the layers of bricks. Researchers also found over three dozen bent nails sprinkled along the edges of the tomb. These were used as magic totems, part of a spell to keep the dead person trapped in their tomb for the rest of eternity. The locals weren't just worried about a body being reanimated from the dead. They thought the cremated person could reanimate their soul and slither out of their grave. The only way to stop them was to wall off their tomb and barricade it with a magic talisman. Johan Claes, an archaeologist from Belgium, said the burial was closed off with three different ways to trap the dead. There was the wall of bricks, the cremation itself to destroy the body, and the magic talismans to prevent the escape of the spirit. Whoever this villain was, they must have been considered dangerous. Archaeologists have found plenty of graves sealed with bricks and plaster. This was fairly common all the way through the Middle Ages because people believed in zombies. Archaeologists have also found graves that used magical sealing methods like bent nails, but never before has Johann Claes ever heard of a grave using all three methods simultaneously. Whoever this person was, he or she must have terrified the local townsfolk to their very cores. What do you think this person did to be given such an extreme burial? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, give us a like and subscribe. See you next time. Bye!